Hello again, Language Arts class. Mr. Spaeth here back again with Chapter 8 of The Unteachables. Uh, in Chapter 7, we got uh, quite a bit about the backstory of the character Kiana and maybe why she feels kind of out of place with the rest of The Unteachables. Uh, today, we're back again with a chapter in the point of view of Mr. Kermit, who seems to maybe have more uh, chapters from his point of view than any other. So... Uh, just a reminder, guys, be on the lookout for your assignments that have to do with this uh, novel that Mrs. Cole and I are reading along with you. And without further ado, here is Chapter 8. When breakfast is mustered on toast, that's a sure sign that it's time to go back to the grocery store. It means I've run out of butter and cream cheese and jam, and I'm digging into the condiment packs left over from my last McDonald's run. Come to think of it, this is my last slice of bread, too, and stale doesn't begin to describe it. The apartment is a dump. Clean enough, but definitely from a bygone era. I can afford much better, but I'm too disinterested to redecorate and too lazy to move. It's the perfect, perfect place for a meal of mustard on toast. The breakfast of the disinterested and lazy. Not for the first time, I picture Fiona's house, with its picket fence and oh-so-green lawn. It's more vivid now, since I can imagine Emma growing up there, playing on the swings, riding her tricycle on the driveway, and playing with her first lizard. I don't think I want to think about her last lizard, thanks to the unteachables. God only knows what happened to Vladimir. He's probably trapped in the walls of the school somewhere, starving to death. If he made it out of the building, he's roadkill for sure. <clears throat> Eventually, I go down to the Cocoa Nerd and start it up in a cloud of burnt oil. I'm actually calling it that, thanks to Parker. For some reason, I can't get it out of my head. Something else to lay at the feet of the unteachables. June has never looked farther away. I'm not even a third of the way to school when the billboard looms up. Come see the largest inventory of new and used vehicles in the Tri-County area. And there's his face, grinning out through a flaming hoop like he's some kind of circus performer. And not the sleazy used car dealer he was always meant to be. Jumpin' Jake Terranova, who will jump through hoops to get you a great deal on the perfect new or used car. Even though I pass his billboard every day, it's always somehow a blow to see him up there. He doesn't look much different than he did as a 7th grader. Always grinning like he's got it all figured out. And he's still selling. Cars and SUVs now, instead of stolen copies of the National Aptitude Test. He's good at it too. Terra Nova Motors is the third largest auto dealership in the state. That's quite an accomplishment. Jumping Jake has come a long way since seventh grade, when his biggest accomplishment was ruining his teacher's life. No, I remind myself, Dr. Thaddeus did that. Sure, the cheating thing was an ugly scandal, but it's not as if I, as if I was in on the scam. All I was guilty of was trusting my students and believing that their best in the nation test score was an honest achievement. My real crime, the one I'll never be forgiven for, was making Thaddeus look bad. The principal, turned superintendent, has been taking his revenge ever since. Jake Terranova was just the first tile that started the dominoes tumbling. The giant dealership looms up on the left. I can't help it. I count how long it takes to pass the vast lots and showrooms. Fourteen full seconds at the speed of traffic. It isn't enough that the Terranova kid got away with his 7th grade shenanigans. Obviously, they gave him the formula for getting rich. He's rolling in money while the teacher he took down is living on bread and mustard and driving a cocoa nerd. Although the main reason I haven't replaced the car is that I blame all auto dealerships for Jake Terranova. A turn into the school lot where Parker's pickup truck is sprawled across the last two open spaces. Sure, give a middle school kid a driver's license. What could go wrong? 
Annoyed, I blocked the pickup in, making a mental note to keep the kid after school just long enough to beat him here. I didn't pack a lunch, but I remember buying a falafel a couple of days ago that I never got around to eating. It isn't on the passenger seat, so I tried the glove compartment. No luck. It must have fallen on the floor and rolled under the seat when the car went over a bump. The Coco Nerd doesn't have much in the way of suspension. Bending over double, I reach around and pat the floor on the passenger side. Sure enough, I find a paper sack. But when I pull it out, there's a hole in the bag, and the falafel is half-eaten and torn to shreds. I get on all fours and peer into the seat. It looks like somebody lost a leather wallet down there. Then it shifts, and two beady eyes pour, peer out at me. I recoil in shock, slamming the back of my head against the dashboard. With a squeak of fear, the creature begins to scramble away, but I jam my hand in and grab it before it can escape through the hole in the floor. Breathing hard, I draw the little guy out and hold him against my chest. Vladimir, I presume? In answer, the gecko poops on my shirt. I sigh, unable to muster up any anger or even surprise. Vladimir is merely continuing a pattern of treatment that's been going on for 27 years. I brush the tiny pellets away. So the fugitive lizard did make it out of the building. Not only that, but he managed to find the one car in the parking lot with a hole in the floor and a falafel just waiting to be feasted on. And he's been here for the past 18 hours, safe and sound, while the custodian scoured the school, listening to every wall with stethoscopes. Still toting the little beast, I get out of the car. I hold on pretty tight at first, but relax when I realize Vladimir isn't going anywhere. Why should he? He's eating the rest of my lunch as we enter the school. I'm actually looking forward to restoring Vladimir to his rightful owner. True, that's dangerously close to caring. But Emma is almost like my daughter from an alt alternate universe. Her being Fiona's kid. The young teacher already thinks my class is a horde of barbarians, mostly because they are. This might get her to consider the possibility that I'm not to blame for it. As I approach room 115, her voice stops me in my tracks. I know teachers get burnt out, Mom, but this is different. He's barely even alive. I teach right next door to him. He doesn't even open his mouth all day. Those poor kids are going to learn nothing because nobody's there to teach them. It's such a shame. I back up a step. She's stalking around the room, updating her bulletin board with gold stars, holding her phone to her ear with one hunch shoulder. What she's saying hurts all the more because of who she's saying it to. A surge of resentment. What does Emma Fountain know about being burned out? She's barely older than the students. She thinks giving middle schoolers gold stars and class pets and lecturing them about being bucket fillers is education? How long has she been teaching? Ten minutes? The first time she tried to take on the unteachables, they laid waste to her circle and, and released her lizard to the four winds. But Fiona's never going to hear that side of the story. Emma address, adjusts a drooping nostril on Harvey the Hall Pass hippo. Okay, fine. He used to be a great teacher once. It's now that counts. Honestly, I can't believe you were actually engaged to that. I tense up, giving the gecko a squeeze. A short, sharp squeak is torn from his little mouth. She wheels and the phone drops from her ear. Vladimir! She grabs the lost pet from my arms and rains kisses down on a scaly head. Where did you find him? Around, I reply stiffly. I'm not in the mood for a conversation about the hole in the back of my car. She's red in the face now. How long have you been standing there, Mr. Kermit? I'm tempted to say, long enough, or something else to make her feel bad, because she of all people should know that wasn't a very bucket-filling conversation. But I hold my tongue. This used to be my favorite part of the day, when the students haven't come yet to ruin it. It's usually downhill from there. 
My dramatic exit is spoiled by a small mustard burp as breakfast climbs a little higher up the back of my throat. I need coffee. I cheer myself by picturing the toilet bowl on the shelf in the faculty lounge, dwarfing all the lesser mugs.